So our main speaker is Darren, and we have Diamantis joining from our engineering team. Um, Diamantis, why don't you go ahead and start off with a quick introduction of yourself? Of course. Thank you for uh, having me. So uh, my name is Diamantis. Um, I have been part of uh, the Android Labs engineering team for two years now, and I have been uh, involved in the development of this feature. So I'm here to answer any questions that come up that require you know technical detail. Fantastic. Yeah, he's going to be helping in the back end with the Q&A and then live throughout. And then Darren, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you, uh, you know, introduce you, introduce yourself and uh, get rolling. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Darren Meyer. I am the uh, lead researcher here at Endor Labs uh, focused on DevOps. And uh, I have a quite a security practitioner and development background. So I, I've been doing variations on development and AppSec and product security for it's going to be close to 25 years now, all told. I've uh, been focused on security for the past 20. Built many security programs, uh, run many security programs. So I'm coming at this from a, you know, how do, how do I help everybody understand new controls as they arrive and as new threats uh, come up? How can we do that? And that's why I wanted to talk to everybody about uh, artifact signing. Uh, it's not just a feature. It's uh, it's a good idea to implement regardless of, of you know what you might choose in terms of technology stack. Um, and I wanted to kind of cover a little bit about what it is, why you might want to use it, and then kind of our our take on it. And I want to go a little bit fast because I want to leave plenty of time for people's questions. Um, I, it's a lot more fun for us to have a discussion than it is for you guys to have death by PowerPoint. So uh, let's get started. All applications go through this basic process. So you guys are familiar with, you know, there's a million variants on it from Agile to Waterfall to DevOps to whatnot, but everybody pretty much you write some code, you share it with your GitHub or your uh, DevOps, uh, Azure DevOps, or whatever platform that you use to manage that, and it kicks off some kind of a CI CD pipeline, right? And inside that CI CD pipeline, you build and package things, you run your test suites, you have your security controls, and at the end of it, you're uploading something deployable. Let's, for the sake of simplicity of conversation, let's imagine it's a container. This is probably about half the time that's what it is these days. So at the end of my pipeline, I have a container that I'm going to push out to my own private Docker registry, say, and then Kubernetes is going to deploy and distribute that. Now, I might be distributing this container out to my customers for them to run in their environment, or I might be distributing this by publishing it to my production environment and letting people have a chance to use it as a service, right? Either way, it's the same basic steps and the same basic concept. And to make sure that I've done this safely, I implement all of these controls, right? I have my static testing, I have my DAST, I have my composition analysis, I might run IAST, I might run uh, container vulnerability scanning, all these kinds of things that I try to do to make sure that my developers haven't made mistakes that might lead to vulnerability, that I'm not consuming vulnerable things, right? That, that have kind of managed my risk. And then I out, come out of the pipeline going, I am confident that this artifact that we have produced, that this container that we have produced meets my risk profile as an organization. You know, ideally, I know that the reality of AppSec doesn't mean we're always so confident, but the goal is that we, we come out of these with these automated tests and we go, we're comfortable with what we produced. But this dotted line kind of poses a little bit of a problem, which is how do I know that what was produced inside of this dotted line is actually what I'm running in deployment, right? I could have a malicious person, you know, put it, push something out into my registry, perhaps. How do I know that that happened and how do I stop it? I could have a developer make a mistake. Shadow engineering is a real thing. Developers having trouble getting something going through the controls of, of your regular CI CD pipeline. They go, look, I'm trying to get my job done. I'm just going to build this on my desktop, package it up, get it out there so I can move on to the next thing. It's not malice necessarily, but anyone who's been in security for a while knows that mistakes are just as costly as malice is, right? So we, we don't have that confidence. And artifact signing is kind of an approach to how do I get that confidence? And we do it by adding two little pieces to this story, right? We add this little signature step here. I have a package, now I can sign that. And I can, once it's signed, I can then verify the signature at any point, like pre-deployment and say, hey, is this a valid signature? And when I'm signing it, I'm not just doing like a, signing a message for an email. I'm also signing metadata about it. So I'm learning did this thing go through and what is this thing? Not just, is it this artifact, but who produced it? When was it produced? Uh, what version of the pipeline did it run through? All these kind of key metadata pieces so that I have a clear link 
when I see something in, in production or potentially in production that I go, I know where this came from. I've established its provenance and I know that the place that it came from, it has reasonable controls. And if I have any doubt about that, I can go check, right? Because now I have that, that kind of clear interconnection. In order to do that, I need to consume a couple things from outside the dotted line, right? I need an identity. I need to know that whoever's signing this, and which is probably going to be a robot, right, of some kind, it's going to be the pipeline identity, right? But I need to know that that's something that I've approved, right? Uh, so I want it to have been logged in to my GitHub Actions OIDC. I want it to have been consumed my Azure ID credentials. Whatever you've already got in place to make sure that your pipelines are authorized to run, you want your signing agent to have a similar kind of, hey, this is a known entity and it's authorized to do signatures. And then I need to do something with the signing data. And I need to create a, like a signature database where I can keep track of all of the signatures that I've produced. And then I need a tamper resistant log that tells me that I've done that activity. And the easiest way to understand this is imagine if I have like a Michael Jordan baseball card or sorry, I said baseball card. I'm silly, a Michael Jordan basketball card, right? And I've gone through all of the, the process of authenticating that this is real. It was really signed by him. It's worth thousands of dollars. I want to sell this now to a store. And in order to do that, I go to a company and I say, hey, could you authenticate this? And they do all the research and they figure it out. And they go, yes, absolutely. This was really signed by Michael Jordan. And this is an authentic basketball card, right? And that's essentially what this is right here. It's that little certificate of authenticity. It says, yes, I, I have this letter now that says this is authentic. But when I take this to the store, the letter describes what it is that I'm authenticating, right? So it has a description of the, of the card and it'll say, you know, this is who we are and we certify that this is authentic. But I could forge that and the guy at the store knows that. So he's going to go call that entity and say, did you actually produce this letter? And they have on their end a log that they did that, right? And that's the, that kind of signing log. And so now I have this kind of three-way thing where I can have the object, I can have a certificate that says this was authenticated as the thing I expect it to be, and I have a log. And that makes it much harder for someone who wants to forge something to be able to, you know, if I can forge a signature, I still can't forge the log of the signature too, or at least it's much, much harder, right? So it raises the bar significantly for an attacker while keeping it low and lightweight for the defenders, right? And then of course I consume that information as part of the verification. What did I sign and was it valid and did it really happen? So you, you've seen this before, believe it or not. You've, everyone has used this at some level. The one that you're probably most familiar with is a code signing solution, which is kind of a subset of artifact signing. And probably you've used either the Microsoft Store, or the Google Play Store, or the uh, Mac or iOS App Store, right? And those are probably the most well-known examples of this kind of signature where they're issuing an identity based on you've you know, paid for a membership and they go have you jump through some hoops to go get a certificate and identity for yourself. You sign the code that you're going to distribute to say iPhones and then you know, Apple, for example, will also do their tests on the application and sign that they trust the whole stack. And if those signatures aren't valid, your phone will not run the application, which is why you cannot run applications that aren't distributed through the App Store, for example. Uh, without special hoops or jailbreaking your phone or bypassing that control, right? So it, these were organizations that had this problem very early on, not only to protect their users, but to protect their business model. And it even has a revocation piece where if somebody does manage to get something malicious into the app store, now instead of trying to chase down and find every single version of this that might be in the wild, Apple or Microsoft or Google can revoke the signature. And when your phone, the next time it goes to check the signature before launching the app, it goes, wait, the signature is no longer valid. I'm going to refuse to run this thing, right? So it gives you this kind of after the point of deployment control to stop new instances of things being deployed, no matter where someone might have got it from by revoking the signature. Similar in spirit, uh, fewer people have heard of it, but it's a really cool project called SigStore. They've kind of aimed to solve like this entire problem here, right? All of the stuff that we added in this slide, SigStore wants to, to solve that for people. And if you're doing some kind of you know, massively public distribution of something, or you have an open source project, SigStore has a hosted public instance 
So all the infrastructure is up and running. It's very much kind of like dealing with Apple. You go get an identity from them. You instrument your pipeline using their cosine utility and you get, you get signature and you get all this stuff kind of for free. Um, it's fantastic. It's open source. Uh, you have the option of self-hosting it, but there's a, a little bit of an asterisk on that. See, public signatures, they contain metadata. That's not okay for every use case. There are a lot of people who, you know, a lot of organizations look at that and go, yeah, there's a lot of things we want to sign that we don't want to necessarily leak to the public. We want to self-force SIG store. That is absolutely possible. But it like don't get the idea that you can go out and do it in a weekend, right? There's there's a lot involved in setting up an infrastructure that you need to do signing well in order to make sure that you, your identities are strong, that your uh, your CA is strong, so your certificates have good authority behind them. You've got the cryptography right, you've got things controlled and monitored correctly. All these things that you need to do to make sure that your signatures can actually be trustworthy becomes on you. And SigStore provides you a nice interface for the user, but you still have to build and manage all of that infrastructure, which, you know, it's not a weekend project, right? This is something that you can plan and roll out over the course of, most people are taking six months to a year uh, that I've seen roll this out. Uh, to get it really kind of in production and, and working. And that that last bit, the, the complexity of, of implementing something like this is kind of why Endor Labs has decided to take on doing kind of this SIG store-esque signature. Uh, so we said, okay, people have a need for private, right? Where they want their signature store in a private data store and everything's encrypted at rest and in transit. Now that's all taken care of. Um, they want something sim uh, seamless, right? You have an, an existing identity management system. You've got your Octo or your Azure AD or your whatever, right? You don't want to have to set up a whole new infrastructure for that. You want to use the one that you have and you don't want to have a lot of complexity in the deployment for developers, right? You want to have low code or no code deployment where they don't have to go through and specify all the metadata that's being signed. You can discover as much of it as possible from the pipeline that you're already running. And then, of course, simplicity, right? Uh, our solution doesn't require that you manage any new infrastructure. We're managing that for you. And then we have these pre-built pipeline steps. Or if you really want to do your own, if you're using some homegrown pipeline system, you can use our no dependency CLI, right? It's just a single binary. It doesn't require that you deploy Java first or anything like that. Right? It's self-contained. Uh, so it's very straightforward to be able to both sign and verify because it's a single command line in a lot of cases, right? or a pre-built pipeline step, or a pre-built rule for Kubernetes, those kinds of things. And because of that, and because of the other things that Endor Labs does with dependency management and, and kind of security awareness in your pipelines to begin with, you kind of get a little something extra by using us for signing. So along this top line, you see kind of what we talked about already, which is, you know, I'm a developer, I produce something in a repo, my pipeline consumes my repository and my dependencies and produces a container in a container repository somewhere, right? And in between there, I've signed it. And, and Endor Labs now has the signature and the log. And when I go to deploy this to, say, my Kubernetes cloud, my admission controller for Kubernetes can validate with Endor Labs that there is a valid signature and is what we expect it to be. So we've kind of covered that use case and how easy that is. But to me, the power of, of using something like Endor Labs to do it versus rolling out your own infrastructure is this kind of, okay, what happens when there's an incident, right? And it's this cloud to code traceability. I have an object in the cloud and my Prisma or my Wiz or my CNAP of some kind tells me, hey, there's an application in this container that has a library with a vulnerability, newly discovered vulnerability, big problem. We need to respond to this, right? So because I have all of these bits, I can validate every instance that I have in the cloud and say, which ones of these are this actually affected object, right? Because Prisma or Wiz will tell me there's an instance of it here. I can go find all the other ones. I can trace it back to a particular library. I can find out where else I'm using that library that maybe you know my CNAP isn't aware of. Maybe it's in something I've distributed to customers, for example. And then I can very quickly tie it back to the repository and therefore to the developers that are involved that need to make the changes to go remediate the issue. And I can revoke a signature and basically mark that container. Once I have a remediated one published, I can mark the unremediated one as you know, essentially invalid and it would treat it just like a malicious container and simply block it from deploying. So I've got not only the traceability, but I've got this admission control piece that let me, lets me uh, prevent regressions, right? Which is one of the big things we saw with like log for shell, for example, is people would remediate the issue and then it would come back because they didn't have good controls on making sure that only the newest versions of things got deployed to production. 
right? And I just want to quickly show you at a high level kind of how that would look in, in GitHub, for example. Uh, you know, here's a very simple build pipeline and we've added a signing step to it, right? And it's very, it's very low code in this case. We're just getting the information about the container, passing it on to our signing action. Uh, and it, you'll notice there's no like API key or anything because this is actually authenticating with OIDC. So that was set up once for the entire org here. And then people can use the, the signature to their heart's content with the policies that are in place. And then what that looks like is very simple. Like when it runs, it'll just say, you know, hey, I just ran this thing. Um, and then we signed it. And it just says, you know, our signature is successfully created. Not much there. But then later on, when we want to verify it before we publish it to, to Kubernetes, we run a similar check. And it tells you about the, the artifact and says, like, not only has it been verified and what that means, but all of this metadata that was automatically detected, right? We know what workflow it was running in. We know the exact version of that workflow. So I can go find it later and find out what was run, which is great when you're investigating a supply chain attack, right? Uh, it tells me who the authority was for the, for the certificate issuer, who did it, what was the authority for the OIDC, right? What environment was everything running in? What source repo? What version of it, right? And I can use those things to chase down the exact version of, of the environment, right? So if I paste that in, I can see the exact code that led to this requirement and I can do it in seconds, right? As soon as I have that information, I can go correlate it. And now I know everybody who contributed to it. I know who was responsible for merging it into, into main. I know all of this information so I can very quickly get the issue assigned to the right people and very quickly research from an operational security standpoint, like was this the result of an accident or is there evidence of some kind of a compromise here, right? Are we the, perhaps the victims of somebody trying to make us the next uh, you know, supply chain attack, for example? So really, really quite valuable. Um, I know I went very, very fast uh, given limited time um, and I wanted to give people plenty of time to ask questions. Um, I, I can answer kind of infrastructure and process questions and we've got Diamantis here to, uh, to kind of deep dive on anything technical. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Darren. Um, we don't have anything in the Q&A yet, so let's um, chat a little bit while we're waiting for some questions to roll in. Yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, like I said, I know I went really fast, but uh, I, I think th I think this is the key to the whole thing, right? Is artifact signing, there are many solutions to this. Uh, you know, if, if you're just after getting an open source project signed for distribution, like SIG stores out there and running, it's fantastic. Um, I, I think the big thing that people kind of forget when they deploy artifact signing is they really focus on the admission control story okay. of, you know, how do I make sure that what I produce out of my pipeline is what's in my registry and is what's getting deployed to production. And that's super important. And I think that's why people start there and focus on it is because that's a missing control. We just don't have that in our environment otherwise. But the, this kind of return piece where because the signature gives you the data that you need to establish provenance, you can use it as part of your incident response. And you can, you can start to do a lot more than just signing containers. Once you, once you understand that it's closing this loop, you can start to do things like, hey, I want to produce a container, but I'm also going to produce an SBOM at build time and sign that SBOM, right? And so now I have a link between, if I need to go share an SBOM with an auditor, for example, I can say, I know 100% confidence that this SBOM belongs to that artifact. I have a strong link between them rather than trying to have to infer it from the SBOM contents and ID information, right? So now my trust that I'm distributing the right information to my uh, compliance interested parties goes up. If I'm trying to investigate, you know, anything like, you know, log Rochelle, where am I impacted, right? Okay, so I know which versions of my package are affected. Can I go find them in production? Well, yes, I have a signature and I can go instrument my operational security controls to go scan my environment and look for any artifacts matching that signature and pull them out. If I've decided to revoke it, I can go find the running ones and get them shut down quickly. Because one of the you know issues that you have as a responder is, I've mitigated this issue and I'm either going to have a regression in that somebody's going to push the old version out somehow or put the old artifact back or whatever the case may be, or there's going to be stuff that I forgot to remediate. Right? It's just out there running in some test environment or some one customer has a special environment that we've partitioned off for them and we all forgot to go look for it, right? And so being, by being able to point these controls out and say like, hey, we are not going to launch any new of this thing and we're going to be able to go hunt and shut down the ones that we know 
that we've decided to revoke the signature on, right? You have a very powerful control to make sure that your, your footprint of a discovered vulnerability shrinks and doesn't come back. Yeah. Um, let's uh, pivot a little bit and have Diamantis come on mic a little bit. So uh, you're the the developer, the owner of this product. Maybe talk a bit about uh, what was interesting or challenging as you were working on the product. Yeah. Um, as the, Darren mentioned, you know, um, the what we had what we looked at was a technology that you know already exists by six store all of the components that are available in open source and you know what you know whether you know we as Ender Labs could see value in our customers that did not want to use six store um because of the complications and the complexity that's that Darren mentioned so um breaking breaking the architecture of six store in the pieces that you know he showed which is basically you know the cli that would order action that will you know initiate the signing and then uh having like a, a certificate of authority that can attest that you know you are who you say that you are who are signing and then you know having um the transparency log and that that basically preserves all of this information that cannot be uh, tampered with uh, the, the research that you know, you know, had to go in place to understand the major pieces was practically the toughest part of this project, um, because once you have identified that you know you need to do some sort of identity store, like you have a, your GitHub or your Azure or whomever is going to attest that you are who you say you are that you're about to sign, and uh, that would be the first piece, and the second piece would be like your signature database. Uh, which is what uh, Cosign or Sixtor is using Recor for that. Uh, and then the third one is the Certificate Authority, which is full seal in the case of Sixtor. So once we figured out the major components for the architecture, then we realized that we already have them for an, in Endor. So, you know, because we were already using GitHub or any other OIDC provider to you know, attest that you are who you say you are because we're using exactly the same workflow if we want to do scanning for dependencies and everything like that. And then we already in the back end had our own certificate authority and we had our own database. So all of the pieces were there. Once we realized that this is what, you know, we need to put this together, then it was just a matter of integration and adding the proper CLI and the additional GitHub action to do the signing and the verification. Um, so it's as as it was mentioned, uh, the um, the challenge was the complexity of all of these things. But once you understand what are the major pieces required, then it was just a matter of you know simply putting them together, you know, at Endor. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention is that even though um, uh, you know in in this in this talk, you know, it was you know we we talked about using the GitHub action to verify. Usually, this is uh, um, this is what we do today in one of our clusters because we are using this particular feature ourselves to do it. Another option would be to use a Kubernetes admissions control, like, like David said, and we already have uh, some um, sample application, sample dem project that is also showing that for customers who want to use an admissions controller. Um, so then that would basically be the piece that would mostly be interested for someone who actually wants to de deploy this in production. And that is also our, our also the, the additional step that we're going to do to to move to a Kubernetes admissions controller to, to, to basically use that part of the verification aspect. Um, in terms of the metadata uh, that Darren showed as part of the signature, all of this information is automatically um, retrieved using the GitHub token because GitHub detects the environment and then adds all of this metadata information as part of the token claims. So we can get this without any additional information, it's just a matter of taking those claims and putting them into the metadata of the signature. Um, and one of the things that we also plan on doing, depending on customer interest, would be the ability to add your own metadata. Like for example, at the time of the signature, um, I, I'm not just interested in knowing what my repo is or what my ref is, but I want to know any other type of information that you would be able to say at the time of the signature, I want to add a key value 
and then we would be able to associate that with the same record that keeps this part of the signature. That may be something that uh, some of our customers, you know, have expressed interest in showing. Um, that's pretty much it. It's uh, pretty simple. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I just shared a link to the docs for anyone who wants to dig into it a little bit deeper. Um, and the product is available to trial for free. So if you want to give this a shot, you can. Um, we've got about three minutes before the end of the session. Darren, um, what would you like to cover before we wrap up? I, I want to just kind of follow on on something Diamante said, because it's really important. That, that ability to add to this provenance information, to add your own key values, is really powerful for anybody that's distributing to customers, right? Because in here, you can do things like, where's the link to the release notes where is the link to the you know the any kind of advisory page for this version where's the link to the s bomb if you're providing it all those things that your customers third-party risk programs would want to know you can actually embed in the signature so that if anybody's going to the wrong place or, or you're a victim of an attack on your website for example that's you know defacing something or redirecting people you can actually go back and say no 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 this is the official source of information for this Right. And it can be really huge, not only for your customers, but for their like incident response teams. If there's ever an issue that impacts your stuff, either like one of your libraries has a vulnerability or you discover a vulnerability that you accidentally introduced. Right. Being able to ship that out to, to customers and say, you know, here's the signature information and here's all of the information that, that you need. And you can know for sure that this hasn't been tampered with, that this isn't a false alarm, those kinds of things, because we have these links back to the canonical resources in the signature, has a lot more value than I, than I think people realize at first blush, right? Anything you can give to incident responders dramatically reduce the cost of securing your environment. Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and start closing out. Thank you everyone for joining today. Thank you, Darren and Diamantes. This has been really interesting. Uh, again, for anyone who uh, wants to try out some of the things that we've been discussing today, some of the resources are in the chat, so you can give it a shot on your own or, um, you know, reach out directly and ask us to show you in a bit more depth what this can look like.